Hi class, it's Bill Berry with the third and final video in the week one demo series on language basics. In the first video, we covered uh, some good stuff. We covered uh, some input and, or not input, but storing and displaying of various types of data and concatenation. Second program, we did procedural decomposition and looked at how to implement it with static methods. And now in this last demo, we're going to talk about summing up numbers. And so we'll get into functions and overloading and all sorts of important concepts. So let's jump in now to the sum numbers example. So let me create that project for us real quick. I'm going to start BlueJay. I'm going to close the current project from what we were working on before. I'm going to create a new project. I'll put it on the desktop and I'm going to call this sum numbers. And I'll create that and I'll create a new class called sum numbers. And I'll say OK. So we've got that created. Everything looks good there. I'm going to put this in the corner and double click this. And as usual, let me go and uh, get us ready. OK, so I've given us a little start at the author, little description, and I've created main for us. But the interesting thing that we're going to talk about now is creating functions that do useful work for us. So let's say that we would like to have a function around that sums up numbers up to a certain point. Let's say that in some project you often need to call this thing and you want to add up all the numbers, let's say, from 1 to 10 or 1 to 20 or 1 to 100 or whatever. So you may very well want a function like that. So we know we're going to create public static. Let's do void for now. We'll figure that out later. And then let's say that we want to just call this sum nums. Now, what is it going to need to take as a parameter? That's our first foray into that. Well, I want to pass it, let's say for now, the highest number that I want to add up. So if I want to add up 1 to 10, I'm just going to pass it a 10. I'm just going to assume I probably want to add from 1 to that thing. So um, we're going to start just like you're declaring a variable, because you kind of are declaring a local variable, right? We're going to give the data type int, and then we're going to say what we want to call that. So I'm just going to say int highest num. And then I'm going to, of course, open and close curly braces, because that's just the way it works in Java. And I'm going to write my code starting in here. So that's, that's easy enough to do. Let's think about return. When this is done adding up the numbers, what is it going to return? Well, it's probably going to need to return a value. Otherwise, what has it done that's useful, right? It's going to add up the numbers, but we need to actually give those back to the calling program. The thing we want to think about is what is the data type that it's going to give back? It's probably going to give back an int. So notice that in Java, just like when you declare a variable, you give the type and then you give the name of the variable. When you declare a function, you're going to have the type of the return. We usually use void because there's no return. We're going to have the type and then the name and then the arguments or parameters in this case. And then that's how you're going to set this up. Now, as a reminder, I'm going to make myself a note that says I need to return something. It's very easy to forget to do that. Luckily, Java will remember to, to remind you. It'll say, hey, you haven't returned anything. Not every uh, IDE will be nice that way. It might just say, hey, you, you didn't return it, so eh, it's your problem. So I'm just going to put something there as a placeholder like return zero. So how am I going to add things up? Well, I know I need a loop. What kind of loop do I need? Is it a definite loop? Can I use a for with it, or is it an indefinite loop that I don't know how many times it needs to run? Well, I know how many times it needs to run or can easily calculate it, so I know I need a for loop. Right? And the way fours work in Java, I'm going to say for, and then you always need parentheses. Right? Parentheses are going to have a very specific form here with a for statement, and then inside here, I'm going to have loop contents, so I'm going to leave myself some space. So the general format of a for loop always starts like that. For, you're going to have something in the parentheses, and then you're going to have the body of the for loop delimited by curly braces as all things that start and stop blocks in Java. Now the format in here is going to generally be, I'm going to want to have a loop, and I want to start at a certain point. I'm going to create a variable. Now notice that I'm creating a loop variable. Interestingly, the scope of this 
and lifetime of this variable are really just the loop. So whatever I create here, I can't use that outside the loop. So I'm just going to say, you know, I'm going to start with a certain number, and I'm going to want to start with that value at 1. Now I'm going to come back and put more here, but what I want to point out to you here is I can't now say num equals num plus 1, for instance. Num actually doesn't exist here, right? This is invalid because num is gone. The scope of the variable is literally the, the loop and the lifetime when the loop is done, the variable is done. So that's an interesting point. Now in a for loop you have at the very start you have a, a declaration generally and you can you can you don't have to declare here but it's typical to declare here and I'm going to say the declaration and the starting point is I'm going to start with one. And then the next thing you're going to put is the test to know how when to stop. I'm going to say I want to keep going while num is, now I'm going to make a little mistake, but maybe you don't notice it at this point, highest num. I want to keep going while num is less than highest num. I want to keep marching forward. Then with the for loop in Java, you have to tell it how to march forward, and almost always it looks like this. Right? I'm going to increment num by 1. The shorthand for that is num plus plus. I could put the full notation if I want. I could say num equals num plus 1, but this is very typical. Notice that each of these is separated by semicolons. Now, there's some other interesting things you can do there, but it's a little more rare, so let's just start with the general form. What do I want to do inside the body of the loop? Well, I want to sum something up, so I'm going to say I want to take sum um, equals whatever the sum was before plus whatever this number is that's in the loop variable, right? Now, if I try to run this, what is Java going to say? Uh, I've never heard of sum. Why are you trying to add something to sum before it exists? I can't find that symbol. So if I want to do an aggregation, an accumulation, I want to start with sum equals zero, right? But that's not enough because the variable needs what? Data type, all right? So now I create an integer accumulator, I set it to zero, and then inside the loop I add those things up, and then of course don't return zero, return sum. So do you see the general form of the for loop that we're talking about here? We're not done, but do you see the general thing? You want to say what happens to kick off the loop? How, what is the test to keep the loop running? And what do you do each time when you're done to move to the next point? So this is a very typical construction. Now in main, just for fun, let's call that. Let's call uh, system.out.println and we're going to say sum through 3 equals, right? And then I'm going to concatenate. I'm going to it, call it sum nums and I'm going to pass it a 3. Right? I can certainly do that within the print statement. I don't need to have a separate variable that's assigned to the, the call to the function. Right, So this should work just fine. Does it compile? Sure. Does it work? Well, that's another question. Let's run main. Sum through 3 is 3. Hmm, wait, 1 plus 2 plus 3. That should be 6, not 3. Why? What happened there? Well, think about it a second. You'll see that we stopped too soon we need to go while we're less than or equal to highest number in this case, right? So we want 1, 2, and 3 to be processed, so we need the equals there. All right, so that's, uh, we were off by 1. It's typical. In fact, as a programmer, you should expect that you're off by 1, and you want to test to make sure that you've done the right thing. So now I think we have it working. Let's compile it, and then let's go run it again, and let's see if it's better now. Six sounds better. Cool. So we have successfully created our simple function. Now again, notice the form. Public static, right now all we're doing is creating public static. Right? Uh, what is the return value? It's going to be an int. What's the name of the function? Sum nums. What are the parameters to the function? We only have one, but it is an integer called highest num. The body is here. Delimited, delimited by curly braces, of course, or not delimited, surrounded by curly braces, right? And then we have an accumulator set up and set to zero. 
of the right type. It's an integer, so it gets a zero. We have the loop. With a for loop, you have initialization, a test, and a, a sequence, right? What happens next in the sequence to move it forward. And inside here, we have the body of the loop. So hopefully that makes sense. We return the value here. So not too bad. It's you know relatively straightforward. But now, this is something that is a little bit mind-blowing, and that is we want to create more than one version of some nums. This is not possible in every language. It's interesting. This is called overloading. And let me tell you why this might be useful. We might decide that it's cool to have one that does the highest number, but you know what? Maybe we don't always want to start at one. We could change this, of course, to make it always require a starting value, but it might be nice to actually have both around. And do I have to give a new name? Do I have to have some nums starting at one? Well, no. In languages that are um, that allow this kind of overloading, that includes C and that includes Java and maybe some others as well, you can actually have multiple ones of the same name of the function, which is a little bit mind-blowing if you haven't run into it before. How does that work? How can I possibly just copy this thing and have something else with the same name? Well, you can't just copy it, so there is a caveat, and we'll talk about that right here. Let's say that I wanted to have one, but rather than starting only with the highest number, I want to say I want to start with the lowest number. I want to have two parameters. Right? And then, rather than simply starting the loop at 1, I started at lowest num, right? and then I continue through highest num as we have here. Now, notice this compiles and there's no syntax errors and it's just going to work. Why? How in the world does this work? It's pretty cool. Well, notice that you don't actually have identical functions. You actually have a slightly different function. It has the same name, but what is different? Well, it has two parameters instead of one parameter. So in this version, this is called a signature, right? The signature is the name of the function and the number and type of parameters. So up here we have some nums that takes one parameter that's an integer. Here we we have one called some nums, but this takes two parameters, two integers. So it's technically a different function to Java. It's called an overload. So this is the cool thing that we can do with an overload. We can say system.out.println, right? And then we can say sum of, and then let's do an example of, let's say sum of uh, two through five equals. Right? And now we can call the other version 2 comma 5 and Java will just figure out which is the right one to call. Now if we had a better IDE and we actually typed some nums and then we typed an open parentheses, right? In a fancier IDE it would actually show us the two overloads here, but we're working with kind of a basic and free by the way uh, IDE, so we can't complain too much. So in this case we've done an overload and we've created two functions that work in this case. So that is pretty cool, a little bit mind-blowing, but to further blow your mind, uh, we can do other things like we could add another version that lets you increment, right? That instead of incrementing by one, you increment by passing a third parameter. Well, what if we want the same thing to work, but we want it with a double, right? Let me paste that in real quick. So notice now, here's the one that lets you increment, and here's one that works with doubles. So again, notice even though you have three parameters in this one and three parameters in this one, their types differ. It's not that they're all doubles or all integers, it's that they have to be different in their signature. So if one called, uh, one could work with three ints and one could work with two ints and a double, that would be considered different. The signature is different. In my particular case, I have one that works with integers and one that works with doubles, and it all just works okay. It compiles fine, and you can just call these things. They're all called sum nums when you call them. So in main, you use the same calls, but you can use the different types of parameters. So now we can actually do the other two, which look like this. So here's the call that does the increment by two, and here's the call that uses the doubles. Again, these all compile, and if we go and try to run them, we will see that it works beautifully, even though we have all these different ones. And look at the output window, and there we go, right? 
really cool, really good stuff. So this is the concept of overloads, and it is a cool one, but it is probably a new one to most of you, unless you've used C or um, uh, Java and you've gone pretty deep, you haven't seen that before. So again, you can use the same name, but you have to have a different signature. The signature has to do with the number and type of parameters, right? So the ordering here, the ordering and the data types make a difference and the number of parameters, that's what overloading is all about. We've also covered basic stuff about functions. How do you return things? What happens if you don't return things? Well, you put void. How do you pass parameters? What happens if you have multiple parameters? So all of these things about basic function uh, stuff we've covered in this video. We've also talked about for loops and how they get kicked off and how the tests work and how the increments work. So we've actually covered a whole bunch of ground in this simple set of demos and I hope that's useful for you in understanding how functions work and getting you started in a good way with for loops and all of these and all of these things so that brings us to the end of this demo I hope these have been useful to you so let me know if you want to see other kinds of things or if you have feedback about the videos so I can uh, change those as I go along uh, but hopefully that's a useful start and that covers most of what you need for week one including most of what you need for the projects uh, the project that you're going to do requires these basic ideas that we have just covered thanks for watching and we'll see you next week